Welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs. Um, I want to thank you for joining us at what amounts to the, the pre-kickoff for this year's Big Read, which is going to be a six-week celebration <coughs> of the iconic Western novel True Grit by Charles Portis. The brochure that we've been handing out details the many ways that you can participate in this exploration of the Western genre and the Old West in general. So we encourage you to check out the book, visit our Central Library exhibit of vintage photographs that are interpreted with passages from the novel, and sample some of our programs. We want to see you often and early, and we want to make this the biggest big read ever. Well, and with your support, we'll do that. But to put you in the right frame of mind, to begin accessing and otherwise getting into the story of True Grit's fictional heroine, Maddie Ross, tonight we offer you a true story, or at least one that's reasonably true, uh, as true as the contradictory and purposely fraudulent primary source documents might allow, a story of a real woman of the Old West, and one whose life certainly exemplified the spirit of true grit. Her name was Josephine Marcus Earp. She was the common law wife of the legendary Wyatt Earp. Her story has been long buried and almost forgotten, but it's been resurrected in a fast-paced and scintillating new biography titled Lady at the OK Corral. In it, we learn of a vivacious woman, a woman who is unafraid to take chances, a woman who is always looking for adventure. The same might be said of tonight's speaker, Ann Kirchner. Over the course of a truly extraordinary career, she earned a PhD in English from Princeton. She later taught Victorian literature there. She's played key roles in several successful entrepreneurial ventures in online media and technology. And previously, she authored a nonfiction work called Sala's Gift that is based on a collection of letters received by her mother when she was consigned to Nazi labor camps during World War II. Currently, Anne is the dean of the Macaulay Honors College at the City University of New York. Lady at the OK Corral, the true story of Josephine Marcus Earp is available for sale courtesy of our friends at Reading Reptile and Anne will sign copies following her presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anne Kirshner. You can't hear me? You can hear me now. But you can't hear me from the lavalier? Okay, we'll figure that out. Um, so yes, this is a true story. Um, and it's wonderful to be in the great state of Kansas because part of the story takes place in Kansas. You see, I just wanted to see if you guys were awake. <laughs> and you are. That makes me so happy. So, um, I have been to Kansas City, Missouri, before. <laughs> Did I do it right? <laughs> I'm just playing with you, you know? Um, thank you, thank you. Um, the last time I was here was for a Kansas City Chiefs game. Um, and I worked for the National Football League, as perhaps Henry told you. Um, I had a wonderful visit here that time. Um, and uh, I understand that you guys are gonna be hosting my poor, pathetic giants this weekend. Um, so all I can tell you is you're gonna have a really good time on Sunday. <laughs> so, um, so it's a tremendous honor to be here. It's a tremendous honor to be even on the same page with True Grit, um, which is a book I 
admire tremendously and perhaps later we can talk a little bit about Maddie and Josephine and uh, what they would have said if they met in a dark alley someplace. <laughs> um, so um, what I'd like to do is read the opening of the book um, before I take you on a travelogue of, of Josephine's adventures. Um, and um, so uh, let's see, are we still on this mic? And are we on the other mic too? Okay, well, let's just, let's just start. So um, this is the prologue to Lady at the OK Corral, and it's called In Which I Land on Planet Earp. Hmm. Did you know that Wyatt Earp was buried in a Jewish cemetery? Oh. Well, those of you who did, just tune out for a minute or two, and those of you who didn't, stay with me. Just hearing his name threw me back to my childhood in Jackson Heights, New York City, sprawled on the floor in front of a black and white television, watching westerns with my big brother Joey, dressed up in his special shirt with braided trim and snazzy snap buttons and black cowboy hat and shiny gun in a faux leather holster slung around his hips. Joey and I tuned in and pretended to walk the streets of Tombstone every week together with millions of Americans, young and old. Joey was my hero, and Marshall Earp was his. Brave, courageous, bold, and Jewish? So that's how it all started, just an innocent question from a friend who thought, correctly, that I would be intrigued by the incongruities between anything Jewish and anything tombstone-ish. This first burst of curiosity about Wyatt Earp's final resting place in religion was easily satisfied. I soon learned that Wyatt was not Jewish, but had lived with a Jewish woman for nearly 50 years. She buried him next to her parents and brother in a family plot at the synagogue-affiliated Hills of Eternity Cemetery outside of San Francisco. And that was my introduction to Mrs. Earp. As children, when Wyatt Earp ruled the airwaves, we didn't know he had a wife, certainly not a Jewish wife from New York. I was a Jew from New York. So each revelation about this woman named Josephine Sarah Marcus evoked new images that made me smile, especially the thought of Wyatt Earp going home for chicken soup after a tough day fighting for truth and justice in the dusty streets of Tombstone, Arizona. I quickly became far more interested in Mrs. Earp than in her famous husband. Contradictions piled up like a freeway collision. How had a beautiful girl from San Francisco via New York and Prussia ended up in Tombstone? While the rest of her immigrant family climbed out of poverty and into bourgeois respectability, why had Josephine run away? What inspired five decades of adventure seeking that took her from the Arizona Territory to California, Nevada, and Alaska, and then finally to Hollywood? Um, so that's how my book begins. And um, what I'd like to do is take you through a, um, you were hearing me okay? Good, no? What do you think? Better now? Okay, louder? Okay, guys, I feel like Janis Joplin. Up, 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 okay, okay. Oh, good, I love a crowd where you can say Janis Joplin and people remember the name, so. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I think that biographers um, sort of fall in love with their subjects, but um, Josephine is a, is a complicated lady, and, um, and I had some complicated reactions to her. Um, but it did all begin with that very personal story. That's me, that's me, and that's my big brother Joey, and I already described to you how he would wear his cowboy hat and we would watch Tombstone. How many of you used to watch Tombstone? So if I sang the theme song, you could probably all sing together with me, but we're not going to. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, but we're not, we're not gonna sing. I'm kinda scratchy tonight. Um, but it, it was something that I grew up with, and one of the reasons that I set off on this adventure was to try and pull together the gaps between the story I thought I knew and the story as it really existed. And one of the things that really drove me was the fact that when you read a lot of the Westerns that were written 
back at the time um, of the real frontier, there were no women there. It was as if these men had no wives or lovers or sisters or, or mothers. The women had simply been rubbed out of the picture. Um, so that was what set me off on this adventure, adventure to figure out who this woman, Josephine Marcus, was. Um, now, you probably heard from Henry that this is, um, this is my second book. My first book was about my mother, um, who was a, uh, a Polish teenager when she was deported and, um, and spent five years in seven different Nazi camps. Um, it was a very dark and very personal excursion. Um, my mother, by the way, is 89 years old, and I called her right before I came here, and um, she asked me the same question she always does, which is, did anybody, will anybody come? <laughs> <laughs> So I feel like before we finish tonight, I got to take a picture of all of you so I can I can show her that uh, that you did you did come, um, and I can tell you that um, my mother has absolutely nothing in common with uh, with Josephine, um, but interestingly, as I began to research Josephine's family, I discovered that here's Josephine's um, the place that her parents were born, which is the district of Posen in what was then Prussia, but really became Poland. You know, this is that part of Poland that was German, Russian, Polish, all, all kinds of things. And this area of Silesia is where my mother is from. So I find it kind of funny that at the end of the day, I ended up right back in this, in this corner of the world. Um, Josephine's parents came to the United States around 1850. It was a huge wave of, of immigration. Um, they came first to New York. That's where Josephine was born in 1860. They spent the Civil War in New York, um, but they were very poor. Um, Josephine's father was not very successful in business. And in the newspapers of the time, the, the people who had gone to San Francisco um, were continually writing in the newspapers about, come to the land of opportunity, San Francisco, that's really where you want to be. Um, and this was particularly true in the Jewish press because San Francisco had one of the most successful Jewish communities that there has ever been. And so Josephine's parents did what was actually pretty common. They took a second hop of immigration. They came from Europe to New York in 1850, and then around 1870, they uh, took off for San Francisco. Um, what they would have done would have been to go down the east coast of the United States um, to the Isthmus of Panama, which had recently been open. They would cross the Isthmus, not by the canal, which had not yet been built, but by railroad. And then they would pick up a steamer on the west coast of the United States and go up to San Francisco. Um, and that's what Josephine's family did. Um, this is a picture of one of those early steamers um, coming into San Francisco. Um, and what's so interesting to me about that is that the, the Jewish community in San Francisco was so big and bustling at the time that on the Jewish high holidays, the steamer service actually stopped. They didn't have any steamers coming into, into San Francisco, which you know, is kind of like the subway's not running in New York. It just doesn't happen. Um, but that's what they did in, in San Francisco. Um, however, the community was quite divided between the German Jews, who, were, who tended to be more affluent and more successful in business, and, um, and had, they were sort of the, the upper crust, and the Polish Jews, and the Jews from every place else, um, which tended to be the group that spoke Yiddish rather than German. They weren't as well educated. Um, and Josephine's family belonged to this latter group, um, and they really were second-class citizens. Um, it changed what schools you went to, what parties you were invited to. Um, and one thing we know about our Josephine, she didn't want to be a second-class citizen in any way, shape, or how. Um, I saw the Jewish community really through the eyes of this fellow, um, Isaac Benjamin, who visited the San Francisco Jewish community and reported at the you know, sort of internal anti-Semitism um, there was in the community. You couldn't really call it anti-Semitism, but certainly schisms within the, within the community. So um, our Josephine would have none of this, and our Josephine, who was very outgoing, vivacious, um, had a laugh, they said, like the tinkling of uh, champagne glasses, 
um, our Josephine decided that uh, maybe there was, there was someplace else that she could, um, she could have more fun. She was also um, always seeking fun and adventure. And at this time in San Francisco, what did you hear about? You heard about the, uh, the frontier, you heard about the boom towns, you heard about places like Tombstone, where uh, silver had been discovered. Josephine was, um, was, was trying to become an actress. She was studying dancing. She wasn't much of an actress. She wasn't much of a dancer. But she was good enough to be recruited for one of the many, many, many pinafore troops that were sweeping the United States. Every town was putting on HMS pinafore. And so Josephine, together with another friend, was recruited to join one of these groups. Um, and, and off she went. Um, this is a picture. That's not Josephine. That's not. Actually, I'm going to show you sort of a racy picture in a minute. I'll tell you when to close your eyes. Um, this is a woman named Pauline Markham who had one, who was the head of one of those troops, and she recruited Josephine and her friend to head off to, this is Pauline Markham, to head off to, um, to perform the pinafore out in the, uh, out in the, in the boom towns. So um, Josephine gets there, and, um, and she catches the eye of a very handsome, uh, aspiring politician named Johnny Bean. Johnny says to her, you know, you're, you're too good for this life. Now, I'm not going to try and do the dialogue. Um, but he says to her, you know, where you really should be is by my side in the wonderful growing town of Tombstone, Arizona, which, by the way, was pretty much the biggest town in Arizona at the time bigger than Tucson, bigger than Phoenix. It was, it was, the, place, it was the place to be. Um, so, um, oh yeah, there's my racy picture. Um, there are no authenticated pictures of Josephine Marcus Earp as a young woman. We know through the eyes of the men who thought she was irresistible that she must have been really great looking. Um, and I will show you some real pictures of her in later life. Um, and I've worked very closely with a forensic analyst to try and put together um, what pictures actually might have been Josephine. And he does think that these pictures might have been Josephine. And you'll find them in places like the, uh, the, Tombstone, uh, the Tombstone Heritage Museum in Tombstone. They're very often reprinted. They're usually identified as, as Josephine. Take it with a grain of salt, but these, these could be her, and they help me imagine what she could have looked like as a, as a young woman. My image of her is Penelope Cruz, I got to tell you. So, <laughs> so um, let me set the stage for, uh, for Tombstone. So um, Josephine arrives uh, around 1880, and, uh, and the whole cast of characters that will change her life really begins to assemble, assemble around this time. Um, here's our friend Johnny Bean. Um, who, you know, he looks kind of respectable there, um, kind of small, dapper, a real hail fellow well met, you know, kind of politician always patting you on the, on the back. Um, but when Josephine gets to, um, gets to Tombstone and she has agreed to marry Johnny Bean, but they're not married yet, she has left home now for the second time and she tells her parents she's coming to marry Johnny Bean. Only when she gets to Tombstone, ladies, he turns out to be a dirty dog. Um, Johnny Bean had lots of women in Tombstone. He was also seeing his favorite prostitute with great regularity. Um, and it didn't take our Josephine long to figure out that she had chosen badly. But now here's the thing about being a woman with a, an OK but not astonishing education, an OK but not astonishing intellect. Um, somewhat talented, she could do the hornpipe, but you know, not good enough to really make a living on, on the stage. Um, what was Josephine to do after she realized that Johnny Bean um, was, was never going to marry her? She doesn't want to go home again, because then she has to admit to her parents again that things haven't, haven't worked out. So there she is alone in Tombstone. Um, and like a lot of women at the, at the time, um, she, needed, she needed protection. Um, so enter Wyatt Earp. And it's funny, when I first started working on this project, um, I, had a, I had a friend who, um, 
couldn't figure out why I was interested in it. And then she began looking at pictures of Wyatt Earp. And she said, you know what? The man was drop dead gorgeous. I understand it now. Um, and, and she's right. Wyatt Earp and his brothers were tall, lean, gritty, handsome men. And Wyatt was the best looking of all of them. Um, he had come to Tombstone with his brothers to work in the town of Tombstone to uh, try and make money on the, on the mines, but more importantly, um, as a gambler and a, and a saloon keeper. And he and his brothers had all come with common law wives. And this woman is Maddie Blaylock. Um, this was Wyatt Earp's common law wife, the woman he brought to Tombstone. Um, Maddie was sort of a, a sad sack, and, um, and well, she was, she was. Um, she kind of looks like a sad sack there, doesn't she? Yeah, kind of stern, you know? Um, and so um, somewhere uh, around 1881, we don't know exactly where, um, Josephine, who was uh, looking for protection, um, found herself um, attracted to Wyatt Earp, and the rest was, was history. But Wyatt and Johnny um, had a history themselves. And um, around 1881, there was a series of robberies. And all of the activity around these robberies eventually led to an event that you have all heard of called the gunfight at the OK Corral, October 26th, 1881. Now, you could explain the gunfight at the OK Corral in a lot of different ways. There were eight people, four on each side. There were Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other. <laughs> this is true. There were people who had supported the, um, the South on one side and people who had supported the North in the Civil War on the other side. You had ranchers and cowboys on one side, and you had the mining interests and the townspeople on the other side. All of that is true, and in everything you've ever read about the gunfight at the OK Corral, you, you hear about all of that. But what is also true is that Josephine had a lover on both sides. Johnny Bean was allied with the Democratic cowboy rancher um, Southern interests on one side and Wyatt on the other side. So these two guys had personal animosity and it was a love triangle with Josephine in, in the middle. So we can talk a little bit more about the gunfight later. And by the way, um, if any of you are real aficionados or if you want to pretend to be a real aficionado, when someone brings up the gunfight at the OK Corral, you should say, you know what? It really didn't take place in the OK Corral, which is true. It took place in the alley next to the OK Corral. So here's, you know, at your next cocktail party when someone brings up the OK Corral, because it always happens at cocktail parties, at least it does at the cocktail parties I go to, um, you, you, know, you know now what to, what to tell them. In the aftermath of the gunfight at the OK Corral, and, and Wyatt was the only man who walked away without a scratch, um, Wyatt, um, Wyatt undertook what has become known as the vendetta ride because he was out to find the people um, who had betrayed his, his brothers. One brother was eventually killed, Another, the other brother, Virgil, was, was maimed. Um, and so there was tremendous confusion in 1882. Josephine went home to San Francisco to get out of town, and Wyatt Earp embarked on this vendetta ride, but then in 1882, he came to San Francisco, picked her up, and with very, very few separations, they were together for the next 50 years. Maddie, by the way, Maddie Blaylock, remember her, the sad face. Um, Maddie Blaylock, Wyatt put Maddie and some of the other wives on a, on a train before he embarked on the, on the vendetta ride. Um, and he, I think it's one of the most cowardly things Wyatt Earp ever did. He put, Wyatt, he put Maddie on a train to go back to his parents, knowing that he was never going to see her again, and left her there with his parents while everybody must have been sort of whispering in corners about Wyatt and his, and his new love. Um, Maddie eventually figured out that she did not belong um, living with um, Pa and Ma Earp, and, um, and she left. But again, here you have a woman with no, um, no visible means of, of economic support 
um, and she didn't find another man to protect her. Um, Maddie became a prostitute. Um, she was a drug addict, um, and she eventually killed herself and died right before she died cursing Wyatt Earp. Um, so here you have the two secrets that Josephine most didn't want you to know. The first was that she had lived in Tombstone as the common law wife of Johnny Bean before she took up with Wyatt. And the second, that Wyatt had been married before and that his wife had killed herself um, saying that Wyatt had, had done her wrong. Um, these were the two skeletons that she had in her closet and they are, um, they are part of what motivated her really for the, for the rest of her life. Um, they never stopped moving around for the next, for that whole time they were together from 1882 until Wyatt's death in 1929. Josephine and Wyatt rarely stayed in the same place for very long. They never had a permanent home. Um, they spent a lot of time moving between Los Angeles, um, a, a desert home they had near the town of, of Earp, um, and, um, and this was sort of their, their magic circle. They, they went to San Diego quite, quite frequently, and Josephine's family in San Francisco uh, and, and Oakland, she did remain friendly with them. So this is sort of the magic triangle for them, San Francisco, Oakland, LA, and uh, near the town of Earp. Um, but along the way, they had lots and lots of adventures, um, and I really have uh, traveled this, this whole map um, with a few exceptions, um, really trying to walk, walk the walk that, uh, that, that they were in. Um, I'd say the place that I went that I found the most interesting was Nome, Alaska. Anybody here been to Nome, Alaska? <gasps> oh my God, three. I've never had more than one. Isn't it just one of the most interesting places ever? Um, and it's quite an obscure place today. Um, there's no roads into Nome. Um, it's way up under the Arctic Circle. If you buy a refrigerator, it comes in by by plane um, or, or over, the, over the Bering Sea, but it's, it's quite remote. So it's very hard to imagine that in the year 1900, it was one of the most popular, interesting places in the world. And that's because gold had been discovered, not under the ground the way it usually is, but right on the shore of the Bering Sea. And um, this is a picture of me um, trying actually to duplicate what uh, everybody was doing with a, with a little gold little gold pan. This is a picture of the crowds that were massing in Seattle in uh, 1899, waiting for the ice on the Bering Sea to break up so that they could get on steamers and, and travel to, to Nome. Um, Josephine and Wyatt spent three years, three summers there. Um, they brought out quite a lot of money, not from gold, but from what Wyatt called mining the miners which was his usual uh, pattern of, of gambling and, and saloon keeping. And when they finished, if that's my mother, just tell her that there was somebody here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was a phone, maybe you didn't hear it. So. Um, so when they left Alaska, they were quite rich and they could have lived comfortably for the rest of their life if they'd sort of banked it, um, but banking it was not in the Earp's vocabulary. Um, the hallmark of Josephine's character was a constant search for adventure. The status quo really had no, had no interest for them. Um, this is a picture of them in that summer camp. Um, there's their little dog, Erpy. That's really the doggie's <laughs> name. Um, and you can see, um, this is Josephine at her stoutest. Um, I think she sort of looks like Sophie Tucker in that, in that picture. Um, and, uh, and Wyatt, you know, Wyatt was an incredibly handsome man. Um, so the other thing about this picture that, um, that I find so interesting is, um, is another hallmark of Josephine's character was that she admired um, women who were very respectable and part of the, uh, the upper social crust as her, her, one of her sisters um, later, later became. Um, and, and that was very much at war with Josephine's love of being an adventurous. So she was quite capable of loving luxury hotels with clean, beautiful sheets and flowers and, and fancy dresses and champagne, 
But she also loved living out in the desert with, with Wyatt. And I've been to the site of their desert camp. You just can't imagine how isolated um, and without any sort of you know, amenities it is. Um, and so the title of my book, Lady at the OK Corral, I, sort of trying to allude to that, um, that, that split in Josephine's character um, between the respectable lady um, and, the, and the adventurous. Um, so the frontier always beckoned, but you know, the American frontier really changed over time. Um, and the frontier in the 1920s was really Hollywood. Um, and Hollywood itself discovered the frontier and reinvented it uh, in the form of, of the early movies, the horse operas. And here you see Tom Mix and William S. Hart, both of whom were very, very good friends with, uh, with the Earps. Um, and as Hollywood discovered Tombstone, Josephine got more and more nervous because if they discovered Tombstone, maybe some of the people who were trying to write movies about Tombstone would discover the real story of Wyatt Earp, the real story of Maddie Blaylock, and the real story of Josephine Marcus, the woman who ran away from home and was living with, with Johnny Bean. So Josephine did her best. Um, she really was a, had a really modern sense of, of celebrity. Josephine did her best to try and squelch the stories that she didn't like. And when an enterprising writer named Stuart Lake approached the Earps to write a biography, Josephine worked very closely with him. She sat in on all the, um, all the uh, interviews he did with Wyatt, and, uh, and she tried to make sure that he wouldn't write about any parts of, the, of her life um, that she didn't want you to know about. Uh, and in fact, um, Frontier Marshall, which was a bestseller in its time and has been in print for uh, really for decades, it was actually given for free to the troops in, in World War II, a very successfully marketed book. Um, Josephine uh, appears only once, and it's at the very end of the book, so the whole section about Tombstone, there's, there were no wives, no women, none of that happens in Frontier Marshall. Only at the very end, Stuart Lake refers to Mr. and Mrs. Earp in their golden years, successful and happy in their, in their Los Angeles home. Um, most of, uh, a lot of Frontier Marshall is, is actually um, fictional. Um, and uh, here's another picture of, of Josephine. Um, Wyatt aged, as you can see, extremely well. Um, he was uh, as handsome when he died at 80 as he was uh, as, a, as a young man. There's a wonderful description of a Hollywood journalist who came to see him, and she describes him as sort of unfolding from his chair as he rose to his full six foot two inches, you know, straight backed and, uh, and, and shook, her, shook her hand. Um, and there's no uh, getting around the fact that his death in 1929 um, was the, the, the biggest cataclysm in, in Josephine's life. This is actually a page that was written by the doctor who was taking care of Wyatt. Um, and when he died, the doctor was reading to Wyatt from a, a book about uh, Tombstone. Um, I actually had an opportunity to try and buy this book at auction recently and it got away. I'm, I should take this picture out. It still annoys me. I want that book. Um, so when Wyatt Earp died, he was a famous man and his death was a national news event. Um, this picture of the pallbearers at his funeral, which includes William S. Hart and, and Tom Mix, William Meisner, the, the playwright, and, and a few others. Um, this picture was all over the, the news um, because it seemed to represent the passing of the Old West. Um, the movies had made Wyatt Earp a very famous man. Um, Josephine uh, wrote to Stuart Lake to ask him to come to the funeral, which he, which he did, um, and you could read about it from, from coast to coast. Um, Josephine had one more, uh, actually two more, um, uh, enormous uh, actions left in her to polish up the legend of Wyatt Earp. The most important one was in the 1930s, and that was when Lincoln Ellsworth, the famous Arctic explorer, approached Josephine and said that he would like to name his little ship which was going to Antarctica on one of the first, uh, first explorations, he'd like to name the ship the Wyatt Earp. 
and he wanted to create a little shrine in the captain's, the captain's cabin um, and asked Josephine if, if she would help him. And Josephine, again, with that modern sense of celebrity, thought this was a great idea and gave Stuart Lake um, Wyatt's last pair of, of uh, eyeglasses. Um, she gave him one of Wyatt's shotguns and a couple of, of pictures. Um, and this is a, a picture that, uh, that Lincoln Ellsworth sent Josephine. And you can just down here see the inscription uh, that he, he sent to her. And this is a picture of, of, um, of Wyatt and Josephine um, after he came back from his, his journey. It's hard to imagine now, this was like the, the moon landing. This was something that people followed in the newspaper every single day. And when Lincoln Ellsworth was actually lost at sea for a while, it was a front page story every day. And so every day in the newspaper, you would read the intrepid Wyatt Earp in search of its lost master, Lincoln, Lincoln Ellsworth. Um, so the movies created um, a mythology for Wyatt Earp. And then in the 30s, this, um, this initiative with Lincoln Ellsworth really polished up that legend one more, one more time. And all of the reality of Wyatt Earp as a gambler, as a saloon keeper, as a pimp, all of that receded into the distance. And you're beginning to see how, you know, Annie and Joey watching uh, Tombstone in Jackson Heights, you're beginning to see how that whitewashed legend really, really came to pass. So Josephine um, may be sort of emboldened by uh, what had happened with, with Lincoln Ellsworth. Josephine thought, well, maybe now it's time for me to tell my story. And she met two uh, cousins of Wyatt, distance cousins, um, this one and this one, um, Vinolia, um, Vinolia and uh, Mabel, uh, Vinolia Ackerman and, and Mabel, Vinolia Earp Ackerman and Mabel Earp Kaysen, and um, agreed to work with them to write her autobiography, to write her memoir. Um, and they worked together. These were two absolutely wonderful women. I've gotten to know um, Mabel's son, um, who's the only person I got to interview who actually knew Josephine. Um, and that was, that was just a tremendous source for me. Um, and here's Josephine, slim down, looking sort of like a respectable, respect, respectable widow. Um, but the closer Mabel and Vinolia came to the real story of Tombstone, because they were able writers and, and researchers, the more nervous Josephine became, again, that fear of exposure, that they would find out what really happened in Tombstone, what Josephine really did, what really happened to Maddie Blaylock. Um, after a while, Josephine called a total halt to the project, and she insisted that Mabel and Vinolia burn the manuscript in front of her. And she put a hex on the manuscript. Um, and, you know, um, that's the point at which people begin to move away from me because the hex was against anybody who would dare to tell Josephine's story. Um, but, hey, I'm still here, right? Um, so Josephine uh, died thinking that there were no copies left of that manuscript, but she was wrong because Mabel and Vinolia had another copy um, and that copy sits now in the Dodge City Historical uh, Archives, where I have spent uh, many a happy day with it. Um, and they, it is a wonderful record of what happened to Josephine, although Josephine's, uh, Josephine telling us her story um, is not always reliable because, as I've already told you, she had, she had skeletons to, to hide. But it's still an absolutely wonderful document. Um, while they were doing the research, Josephine went back to Tombstone and stopped in the town of, of Earp. Um, and it was really there that I think she made this decision that they really had to, to burn the manuscript. Um, she stopped seeing the cousins, Mabel and Vinolia, when the, uh, when the manuscript um, was, was burned um, and descended into something that was probably dementia and was increasingly paranoid in her last years. Um, this is a, a note that she wrote to a very good friend of Wyatt's, and um, when he wouldn't answer the door, she punched out the, the glass and, and tried, to, tried to get in sort of something out of, a, uh, out of a horror film, and he began recording some of the things she wrote to She said to him, I'll get back at you good and hard, Mrs. Earp. 
So this was, this was written by Wyatt Earp's friend, who was really scared to death of her at, at that point. Um, she also uh, was penniless. You know, whatever money they had had been spent. Um, and when Josephine died, uh, and this is from her uh, memorial service on December 22nd um, on, uh, in 1944, she died on the, on the 19th, um, Josephine was penniless. Uh, William S. Hart and, uh, and Henry Grauman, the owner of, the, of Grauman's Theater in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, who was a friend of theirs from Alaska, they paid for the funeral. Um, she died in debt to many people. Um, and she also was, of course, hardly mourned. Um, there were very few family members that she hadn't quarreled with. Um, and she, uh, the people she was in debt to, certainly, um, were, not, uh, were not mourning her. And there were some little, little things in the paper, widow of famed lawman dies. Um, but that was, that was pretty much about it. Um, and she was then buried in the family plot, which is where she had brought Wyatt's ashes uh, in 1929. And although her Jewish identity was you know, uh, not very strong, um, in fact, she was sort of indifferent to being Jewish, at those moments of crisis when, when Wyatt died, she took his ashes and she buried them in the family plot next to her parents, next to her brother. Um, and then when she died, um, her family and William S. Hart saw to it that, uh, that she was buried in, um, in, that, same, in that same cemetery. Um, so that's, um, that's Josephine. And, um, you know, I don't think there's any more American story than uh, the story of the American West and the frontier. Um, it's burned into our psyche. You're working uh, and reading about it um, during, this, during this big read. Um, but you can't tell the story of the American West unless you put the women back in the picture. And when it comes to the women of the West, um, I think we've got a really interesting one here in, uh, in Josephine, Sarah Marcus Earp. Uh, and I thank you very much for, uh, for hearing about it. Thank you so much, Anne. That was an excellent summary of your book. And um, we have a time for a few questions. And all I ask is that um, you come to either this microphone or, or that one over there. And um, Anne will uh, uh, answer questions serially. And uh, then she'll be outside uh, signing copies of uh, Lady at the OK Corral. Did the cousins ever do anything with the manuscript? Did, was it published? Um, the question was whether the cousins did anything with the manuscript. Um, they, they respected her wishes while she was alive. Um, and then after she died, they did try to publish it, um, but had no success. Um, and while they were still trying to publish it, um, because by now, you know, 1955, the, the TV show begins, um, and so they're really very interested in, in whether what they knew about Josephine could, could really be, be brought out. That's when they, uh, the first word about Maddie Blaylock was discovered. And uh, Mabel really threw herself, Vinolia had died already at that point, Mabel really threw herself into digging up as much about Maddie Blaylock as, as she could. Um, and I found Mabel a very, a very sympathetic person um, who you know, had a realistic, uh, realistic sense of, of Wyatt and was, was sad that he had been built up so high that now when the story, the real story would come out about Maddie, he would absolutely crash to the ground. You know, in, in Mabel's view, and I guess I share her view, people are neither that good nor that bad. Most of us have you know, a mixture of, of both of us uh, in, in, them, in us. So, um, so they never published it, um, but their daughter gave the manuscript um, to a, an enterprising writer um, named Boyer, Glenn Boyer, and, um, and Glenn published a version of it, um, filling in the blanks, shall we say, with his imagination, um, and published it as, um, as I Married Wyatt Earp in the, in the 60s. Um, I became very good friends. I'm probably I'm giving you too long an answer. 
The, the story is that uh, it, it was Glenn Boyer who owned the manuscript and gave it to the Dodge City, uh, Kansas archives, and um, and that's and it was through him that I had I had access to it. So the answer is no, they didn't publish it. Glenn published it, but he filled in the blanks with some stories of his own. We saw these characters a couple decades ago being presented on film with the. Uh, Kevin Costner movie, Wyatt Earp, and the uh, Kurt Russell movie, uh, Tombstone. Uh, all these characters are depicted there. How, how do you like their depiction in those two movies of uh, Maddie and uh, Josephine? Um, well, they really bear no resemblance to reality. Um, although I, I kind of like Dana Delaney as, as Josephine. I, I, think she did, I think she did a pretty, pretty good job. Um, but I don't think any of them really got at her character, and I don't blame them for that. They're movies, right? So um, they're entitled to, to fictionalize it. Um, the only fictional uh, depiction of Tombstone that I'm very fond of is not a film, but a novel by Robert Parker called um, Gunman's Rhapsody. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful novel and uh, really imagines the romance between uh, between Wyatt and Josephine um, in a, uh, I think, really a, a very believable sort of way. What uh, happened to John Bean? What happened to John Bean? Well, um, somewhere along the line, uh, now he was the first sheriff of Cochise County, so no one could ever take that away from him. He and Wyatt battled for it and, and Johnny won it. So he's in the, he's in the history books for, for that. Um, when he left uh, Tombstone, um, he had something with him, uh, which was syphilis, um, and it eventually killed him um, quite, quite young. Um, he went on to sort of an interesting career before the syphilis got him, um, but uh, even to the end of his days, he and Wyatt Earp were sort of duking it out in the newspapers for who had the real story of Tombstone. By the way, he had a son and when Josephine first went to Tombstone, she was taking care of that son. And to the end of her life, she remained very, very close with Johnny Bean's son, which I think says something about Josephine. As you were doing your research into Josephine, what was the biggest surprise you encountered or biggest aha moment uh, when you were uh, engaging with her? I think the biggest aha moment was that she never slowed down. She never said, oh, Wyatt, can't we just put down roots and buy a house and get domesticated and, um, you know, sort of settle down like normal folks would. She never did that. And, and so that fuel of constantly, let's move on, let's take another risk, let's just go ahead, I just, I just found that really incredible. gather they didn't have children. Is there any indication they ever wanted or hoped to or specifically hoped not to? Or <laughs> I think there's every indication that they did hope to. Um, they were very close to Wyatt's, uh, Wyatt's family, the, the young kids, and Josephine was a very devoted aunt um, to her, uh, her nieces and, and nephews. I think she had two miscarriages. Um, why she could never have carry a baby to term, I, I don't know. Um, but I think it was a source of, of grief, of great grief to her. When, when Stuart Lake's wife was, um, it, it actually makes me angry because it, it has been written about her that she hated children, which uh, there's absolutely no evidence of. And when Stuart Lake's wife was pregnant, um, Josephine would continually write to Stuart, did the stork come yet? Make sure you let me know. I really want to hear about the baby and the blessed event. And, and all of this stuff, it's, it's, it's totally spontaneous and, and warm. So I believe she loved children and would have been very happy to, to have them. Maybe I'm saying that as a mother of three. I don't know, but I, I really do think she did. Thank you.